A special welcome to all of you who are joining us here today, whether you're in homes, in life groups around Cape Town or South Africa, or somewhere else in the world. A very special Christmas to you all. And kids, a very special welcome to you. Christmas is such a significant and special occasion. And we're delighted to be hosting you today. I'm Rigby, uh, and this is my wife, Sue, and together, uh, we serve uh, on the leadership team of Common Ground in Cape Town. Uh, I'm privileged to have my son Ryan and my daughter-in-law uh, Shelley and our two beautiful granddaughters. This is Madison and this is Libby. And here we have Ezra Jack, our latest grandson. So girls, why don't you tell us what excites you the most about Christmas? Um, presents and spending time with family. I love the whole thing. I love the presents, I love spending time with family, I love the food, particularly spending time with my bumpy. He made me say that. <laughs> <laughs> me too. I also love everything about Christmas, but particularly the presents. My favourite memories are sitting around the Christmas tree opening gifts. Wow, so these things we can talk about all day. The conversation can go on and on about all the special things we enjoy about Christmas. But now we're going to turn our attention to the one who the whole day is all about. Maddie is going to read a portion of scripture as we prepare to sing and worship together and make much of Jesus' birth. Isaiah 9 verse 6 to 7 For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. So friends, we're about to uh, sing some wonderful ancient uh, carols and we'd like to invite uh, uh, all of you to participate at any level that you're comfortable. And let's join hundreds of millions of followers of Jesus as we sing these amazing songs together.
Jesus.
demonstrated exactly who you are to us. Thank you that you became like us but through a virgin birth so that ultimately you could take our place and you could redeem us on that cross. Uh, we just want to prepare more room in our hearts for you this Christmas. We want today to be absolutely all about you. Uh, we pray that today just fresh truth, fresh joy, fresh peace would fill our hearts as we celebrate who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Now, parents, if you have kids and you've prepared the Christmas activity packs for them, now's the time to take them out. But kids, be sure to listen during the service because this message is for you today too. As we enjoy uh, this celebration moment, we also recognize uh, that this year has been very tough and challenging for so many uh, in our city. But the good news is that Common Ground and Common Good uh, have had the opportunity to partner together uh, throughout 2020 to bring much needed relief to different parts of our city. So we're going to watch a short clip from Common Good where we get to celebrate uh, what, what has been happening through uh, our collective efforts in 2020.
We so appreciate being able to serve the city with common good in these ways, uh, not just now, but in an ongoing way year round. If you're newer to our context and would like to know more about common good and the ways that you can serve the city with us, please visit commongood.org.za. Right, as we mentioned, gifts are an important aspect of Christmas. In fact, Ryan, who leads the Rondebosch AM congregation, is going to be sharing our Christmas message with us today. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to him now as he talks about the gift of God. Hey, well, thank you, Rigby and the whole Wallace clan. And I just want to add my own Merry Christmas to everyone that is joining us today. I love the thought of congregations gathered together in venues across the city, families and friends gathered together in home. And, and even some of you who may be joining us on your own today, you are gathered together with us in this moment. And a special Merry Christmas to all the kids too. I remember as a kid, the excitement of trying to go to sleep the night before Christmas and thinking, would I be able, would I be able to fall asleep? And then the next minute it was morning, right? And in our home, we were allowed to rush through and get our stockings. It always amazed me just how much of my school stationery for the next year managed to find its way into my stocking. But we knew that those were only the hors d'oeuvres. The real deals were the presents that were under the tree. Those we couldn't touch just yet. As if waiting all year wasn't long enough, now we had to wait for everyone to wake up and everyone to gather around. And birthdays are great, right? But Christmas, Christmas is so much better because at Christmas, everyone gets presents. It's like everyone's birthday all at once. And my poor mother-in-law, it's actually her birthday on Christmas. So she has to share her birthday with all of us every year. But don't you think presents are just the best? And, and to be honest, what I've realized is sometimes the anticipation of those gifts was something more wonderful even sometimes than the gift themselves. So much mystery, what's inside them? So much anticipation, what's it gonna be? So much possibility, could it be my dream gift? As I'm saying this, I know that the entire time, kids, you guys are struggling to look at me, right? Because you're eyeing these gifts, these presents over my shoulders here. Well, don't worry. I think you're in good company because I can guess that a number of the adults are looking at them too. We never get too old for the mystery and the anticipation and the possibility that presents bring. And the good news is that we're going to open all three of these over the next few minutes as I speak to us about the true gift of Christmas. Because when we think about the whole idea of getting something special that you didn't have to earn or you didn't have to deserve, well, that's what the big story of Christmas is all about. And did you know that gift giving has been with us almost from the very first Christmas? It has. And that is the story that we're going to be looking at in the Bible today. The story of the gifts brought to Jesus after he was born. And to help us do that, I'm going to call up Munger, one of our high schoolers, uh, to come and read Matthew chapter 2 and verse 1 through 12 to us. Let's listen to how this story unfolds together. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, For this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star that they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. 
Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Thank you, Manga. And so love the, the retelling of that story. Now, let me create a little bit of Christmas lunch controversy by popping some of the traditional bubbles about these wise men that we've just been reading about. Firstly, did you know that they didn't just see the star and then jump on their camels and go see what was happening in the moment? No, it actually took them a long while to get there. Scripture tells us that they are men from the east, but we aren't exactly told where in the east they're from. So while we don't know how far they had to come exactly, we do know that it must probably took quite a while. So here's the first big bubble popping moment. They weren't there that night. I know, I'm sorry. You are definitely going to have to change your nativity scene after I'm done here, right? Because either the wise men have got to go or the manger, the animals, the crib, well, they've got to go because they definitely didn't happen at the same time. Historians reckon it could have been anything from a month to two and a half years before the wise men actually got there to be with Jesus. And scripture seems to back this up when it tells us that they came to Mary's house, not to the inn with the manger and the stable out back. No. And it also in scripture continues to tell us that she was with the young boy, not a baby. And from King Herod's ill-intended estimations, we can guess the boy Jesus could have been anything up to around two years old by the time they got there. So I'm sorry, but if you're looking to be biblically accurate with your nativity scene, then you're going to have to put those wise men somewhere a little further away, right? And then here's the biggest bubble burst about these wise men. We're not sure that there were three of them. I know, I'm sorry. Your nativity scene is never going to be the same again. And I'm guessing that some of you kids think that I'm the Grinch of Christmas right here, popping all these traditional nativity scene bubbles. But the truth is that we don't know how many wise men there were. There could have been anything from two to dozens of them coming to see what the star is all about. In fact, it's most likely from history that there were many of them traveling together in a bigger caravan. So why do we always refer to three wise men? Well, that's because tradition has attached one wise man to each of the three gifts that we definitely know were brought to Jesus. The truth is the Bibles can't tell us how many men there were, but they can tell us how many gifts there were. Okay, that's the end. Thus endeth my fun Christmas trivia to spark nativity scene controversy. You're welcome. My pleasure. Hope you have some great conversations over your Christmas lunch. But what we do know about these magi is that it's likely that they studied all sorts of interesting stuff, including the stars and all the sacred texts and prophecies of the ancient world. So when they saw that special star in the West, they knew that something special was happening. And it was so exciting to them. And they knew just how important it was that they all packed up, got their stuff together, got onto camels and traveled all the way to Jerusalem and then Bethlehem. And this was likely a a pretty big journey. And what we do know is that they came before Jesus with these three very specific and meaningful gifts. They were valuable items because in the ancient world, these three gifts were standard gifts to honor a king or a a deity, gold, a precious metal, frankincense, perfume or incense, myrrh and an anointing oil. In fact, in the book of Isaiah, when describing Jerusalem's glorious restoration, it tells of nations and kings who would come and bring gold and frankincense and proclaim the praise of the Lord. Isn't that significant? That's what's happening right here in this story, foretold by the prophet Isaiah. And each of these gifts had great significance. So can anyone guess what's inside this, our first present that we're gonna open for today? I'm gonna ask one of the Wallace kids to open this for us. Why don't you guys catch? Here we go. That's right. 
This is gold, a a gold crown. And and no, they wouldn't have given Jesus a gold crown, but the gold that they gave Jesus would have represented a crown because the spiritual and cultural meaning of gold is that of great worth and kingship. And this was fitting because we can see from the Magi's interaction with King Herod that they were there to find out. And this is what the text says, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and we have come to worship him. They were looking for a king. I just love this about Jesus's life right from the beginning and then happening again and again in Jesus's life. It was those that were furthest from him, not those who were meant to be expecting him and believing in him and turning to him that seem to somehow be drawn closest to him. The wonder and mystery of this God man attracted the people that are often considered outsiders. And he still does that today. He welcomes us in. We heard last week that the shepherds, those guys who were isolated, they were low level workers in that age. Well, they had been the first to meet Jesus. And now the Magi from another nation had traveled from far to come and worship the King of the Jews. There's so much irony in this. We call it the upside down kingdom where the last come first And that upside down kingdom is seen again when the Magi get to come to this humble home and they find humble young parents holding a humble, powerless little boy. And yet, what do they do? With their gift of gold, they recognize him as the king of the Jews. And that statement alone carries significance. He's the long awaited one. He is the fulfillment of all 513 prophecies. He is the promised Messiah. So the Magi, these non-Jewish wise men of dignity and wealth, what do they do? They bow down and worship Jesus. Just as the angel had told Mary before, we can hear those words in Luke 1 through uh, 30 through 33. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the son of the highest and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. See Jesus gets the gift of gold because he is the true king and of his kingdom there will be no end. I wonder, what about the second gift? What about the second gift? Can you you guess what it is? Let's ask one of the kids to open it for us. Look at that. Look at this precious bottle. This is frankincense. And frankincense was greatly valued throughout the Middle East, from Rome to India. And it was an expensive, wonderful fragrance. And frankincense actually occurs some 15 times in the Bible before we get to the story of the Magi. And a quick survey reveals that it was used, it was used primarily in biblical times for making incense, as we see in Exodus. And also it was an ingredient in the sacrificial process, as we see in Leviticus. And then also in Song of Solomon, we see that it was a perfume, an ingredient in in beautiful and, and fragrant perfumes. And since frankincense was primarily used in the Bible in worship, frankincense speaks of the priestly worship of God. That's why in some of the high liturgical churches, even today, frankincense is still used. And symbolically, this gift of frankincense is often thought to represent the fact that Jesus came to earth to be our high priest. It was something of a prophetic showing of who he was. Listen to how Hebrews 7 verse 26 and 27 speak of Jesus as our high priest. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens. 
He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. Can you see that this passage is telling us that because of Jesus, we have no need for any human mediator between us and God any longer? He came to be our great high priest for all time. What a gift, right? And Hebrews elsewhere explains then that we are able to approach Jesus as our high priest. In verse 14, it says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into the heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy to find grace to help us in our time of need. I'm so glad that the first gifts of Christmas ever given almost 2,000 years ago point so powerfully to meeting our needs right here in 2020. I suggest that Jesus is the king and he does sit on the throne, but that it is a throne of grace. That's what this verse tells us. And we can come to him with confidence to receive mercy and find this grace to help us in our time of need. I know that 2020 has been a very difficult year for so many, but it's my hope that you would draw near to Jesus today. He is the great gift of Christmas and he is our king and our high priest and he welcomes us to approach his throne of grace in our time of need. What a great gift, right? And this leaves only our final gift. Any guesses? Gold, frankincense and Myrrh, that's right. And I'm actually going to talk a little bit about this final gift before we get to opening it and seeing what it looks like. Because the third gift that the unknown amount of wise men brought to Jesus isn't something that we are are, are very familiar with. It's not something that we know much about today. Do you know what myrrh looks like? Well, let me put up a picture for us. This is what myrrh looks like. Can you see the green leaves? but also those big, sharp thorns all around the green leaves. Now, what we might not know, but we might be able to tell from this picture, is that to extract myrrh is pretty tough. Here's how Wikipedia explains the process. When a wound on a tree penetrates through the bark and into the sapwood, the tree secretes a resin. Myrrh is harvested by repeatedly wounding the trees to bleed the gum. They literally have to harshly wound these trees over and over by slashing them to get the resin out to make this myrrh. In the book of Ruth, Naomi is at the lowest point in her life and she cries out, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara because God has made my life bitter. In another place in the Bible, in the book of Exodus, there's a place called Mara. And no one could drink the water there because the water was so bitter and caused death all around it. The word mar comes from the same origin as mara and mara. And it represents bitterness, pain, and death. Quite a gift to give to a young child, right? And unfortunately, there isn't much redeeming its intention either because this gift signified Jesus' future death and burial. His life would end in pain and this gift of myrrh would be understood in its completeness in that moment. The slashing of this thorn, torn, crowned body would lead to the extraction of something way more precious than just perfume. It would be his life-giving blood that washes away the sins of the world, a perfume that the scriptures tell us take away the awful stench of death. There's so much beauty in this prophetic gift given to Jesus. And this wasn't the last time that Jesus would be given myrrh either. 33 years later, as he he hung there on that cross, looking at those he had created and calling out to his heavenly father to be gracious to them, for they knew not what they were doing. Jesus was once again offered myrrh mixed with wine to help ease his pain. 
And after Jesus had died, John 19, 39 tells us that Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes to anoint Jesus' dead body. All this was happening to carry through this theme of the gift of myrrh being given to the true king and the true priest who gave us the greatest gift of all time, the greatest gift of Christmas himself as a loving sacrifice for all. So why don't we open this last gift of myrrh together? There it is. This is myrrh. This is what it looks like. And I'm going to put it down over here so the thorns don't pierce my hands, right? Now, I want to ask, what do you think the best thing about gifts is? I think it's that we don't have to earn them. We don't have to work for them. We just have to receive them because they have been freely given to us to receive. And his desire, Jesus' desire is that all people will open the free gift of his life given for us. This is the most important gift of Christmas. I remember when I was 20 years old and I was in a place of real desperation and I'd been traveling for about two years and and I'd pretty much kind of lost love a little bit as you do as a 20 year old and, and I felt very broken within myself. I can remember on a train somewhere between New York and Kansas City in the States, reaching out to God, calling out to God, feeling at the bottom of my own human barrel and saying, God, if you are real, like my parents say you are, then won't you come and make yourself known to me now? It was in that moment that I opened the gift of Christmas, the greatest gift of Christmas, Christ's own life given for me for the very first time because in that moment, I felt a love from heaven rush into my life like I'd never experienced before. It was almost tangible in my body. I can remember crying. I can remember feeling overwhelmed. I can remember other people in this long distance train coming to speak to me to check that I was all right. But I felt so overwhelmed in that moment of desperation, reaching out to God. And then I felt so overwhelmed by His love being made known to me almost tangibly in my body. And I received that, the greatest gift of Christmas for myself for the first time. Not because my parents said I should, not because I was going somewhere that said, this is the weight and you must walk in it. No, because I knew that there was a God-shaped hole in my heart and I reached out to Him. And the greatest gift of Christmas filled that God-shaped hole in my heart. When I first opened this gift of God's goodness for the first time, I had no idea just how much this great gift of Christmas, Christ Himself, would impact my life forever. And that's ultimately what we're celebrating here on Christmas. Yes, we we do. We celebrate these, the first three gifts of Christmas, and their important meaning to us and to our lives. Can you remember what they are, kids? Gold? for Jesus being our great King, frankincense, recognizing Jesus as our high priest, and myrrh, for Jesus, our perfect sacrifice. But it's important to remember that these first gifts of Christmas, they they nothing compared to, and they only point towards the greatest gift of Christmas, which is Christ Himself, God's great gift to all the worlds. And what did the Magi do? The Magi fell before Jesus and in joy, they worshiped him. He was the one true king. He had come to mediate peace between mankind and their creator. And he came to bring his love to us through giving us his life. So this is what we're gonna do now. Christmas is a time of celebration. Christmas is a time of great joy. Christmas is a time of receiving gifts. So let's make sure that we grab hold of the greatest gift of Christmas together, Christ Himself, heaven's great gift to all of us. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for Christmas. Thank you for these three gifts that speak of such deep meaning and what Christmas genuinely means that you are the true King and that was announced that first Christmas, that you are a high priest that causes a way for us to be reconciled to our heavenly Father. 
And thank you, God, that you are the one who, who was willing to, to give your very own son to be sacrificed on a cross for us that we may truly live. We love your generosity in that, the greatest gift of Christmas. And we choose to celebrate it now. As we enjoy all the other elements of Christmas, God, may we not lose hold of this, the biggest thing happening this Christmas. We love you. We invite you to be leader and Lord over all our Christmas celebrations. And we bless your holy name. Amen. Now, as we consider this the greatest gift of Christmas, Christ himself, we're gonna be singing our final song together. So can I invite you to please stand with me where you are and let's sing together. Merry Christmas, everyone. Thank you, Ryan. Bumpy? Yes, Libby? One of the things I realized today. In history, many babies have become kings, but we celebrate the only king who became a baby, Jesus. Oh. Right, Libs, that's why those three wise men brought those costly gifts. Well, isn't that insightful from my granddaughters? <laughs>
So friends, I hope you're feeling as grateful as we are today and that you've been freshly reminded of the gift of gifts. Could this be the Christmas, if you're not yet a Christ follower, where you consider opening your life to the rule of Christ, this baby who's become a king, who offers us beautiful, free forgiveness, everlasting peace, and a brand new life. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, yeah, just a few final words from us. For those who are new to church or back in church after some time, thanks for coming. We love that so many people are journeying in their faith and would love to serve you in that. We have an Ignite booklet, um, which we'd like to give to you. It's a 31 day journey into the Bible for new believers or not yet believers. This is our gift to you and you can find it on our website or under the services online. This is a great way of taking a step in your faith. Well, friends, before we uh, sign off, uh, we'd love to invite you to one of our regular Sunday uh, gatherings, uh, COVID regulations permitting, and just a reminder, let's keep safe as much as we can in this season. Uh, we meet every Sunday in the various venues, uh, but until it's safe to gather in those venues, we'll be meeting online. Please check out uh, our website and the various uh, uh, congregational Facebook pages uh, to get all the details. And friends, any Sunday is a great Sunday to come and visit us. And finally, we know that this is a trying time for many. And if you're in need of pastoral support or prayer, won't you move towards one of our pastors or make use of the telephone number that we've made available? We'd love to serve you and pray with you. Well, that's all from us. And we trust that you have a wonderful Christmas and make the most of the best gift that was ever given to us, Jesus himself. Merry